Testing, testing, one, two. Okay, I think we're live. So, as I just said, Battle of the Atlantic happens, 1940, all the way until 45. Germany readopts its unrestricted submarine warfare policy that it used to great success in World War I. Britain begins developing new technology and new tactics and strategies to use against this. This would lead to the evolution of radar and sonar, but more importantly, this would lead to the cracking of the Enigma code, which is the code cipher that the German military uses for all of its operations. From that point forward in 1941, the Allies have the advantage in communications. So now the Allies know where German troops are going to be deployed, where they're going to go, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody tracking with that? Cool. So, at the conclusion of 1941, December 7th, the United States will enter World War II, World War II because of the attack on Pearl Harbor. But while there will be many nations within the Allied powers, the three major powers will be the United States, British Empire, and the Soviet Union, led by FDR, Winston Churchill, and Joseph Stalin, respectively. The big three, as they would become known, <clears throat> agreed that they needed to concentrate their combined strength in the European theater before shifting priorities to the Pacific. That's a big point there. Everybody probably needs to write that down. All right. In the, way, in the days following Pearl Harbor, the Japanese Empire expanded rather quickly by attacking different Pacific islands and atolls across the Pacific Ocean, including the Philippines. United States and Filipino forces would try to hold out as best they could, but after five months of fighting, they could not, and, were, and so some were forced to retreat, one of those being the Supreme Allied Commander in the Pacific, Douglas MacArthur. MacArthur would vow to the people of the Philippine Islands that I shall return. Okay? All right. With the Battle of the Philippines, you also have the result of the Bataan Death March, in which the Japanese forcefully make their prisoners of war, which is the largest... Going back, the Battle of the Philippines results in the largest surrender of U.S. forces in history. Because of this, this leads to the Bataan Death March, where the Japanese army forces <clears throat> survivors of the Battle of the Philippines on death marches in a way that will be reminiscent of something that we will look at here shortly. This is the height of the expanse of the Japanese Empire, which will be at its largest in 1942. Everything in red on this map, it belongs to Japan in 1942. <clears throat> Meanwhile, in the European theater, there are two different theaters of war, the European theater and the Pacific theater. A theater is an area that encompasses military operations, in case you're confused about that terminology. In the European theater, Operation Barbarossa, the Nazi plan to invade the Soviet Union, begins to stall. The reason that it begins to stall is because Operation Barbarossa was delayed because German involvement in Italy's poor invasion of Greece. Because of its delay, Nazi troops find themselves trapped in the Russian winter. <clears throat> so tanks begin to freeze over, along with horses end up dying. And the German army is not equipped for a winter campaign because Hitler forgot to give his troops winter supplies. German forces would come within 15 miles of Moscow, but would not be able to take anything else because of the harsh winter and the Russian scorched earth tactics. At the height, at the, the largest expanse of the Third Reich will be this map from the Atlantic Ocean to 15 miles outside of Moscow, over into some of the Caucasus region, 
along with all of the different um, smaller states that German dependent states that make up the axis, such as Bulgaria, Romania, Slovakia, and Hungary. <clears throat> the Von Sien Conference. After their territorial gains in Operation Barbarossa, Hitler and the Nazi High Command meet in Berlin to discuss the implementation of the final solution to the Jewish question. For those of you who are looking at me like, wow, that was a mouthful. Yes, it was. The reason for that is because the German not the Nazi ideology about this mass genocide was to make it seem as bloodless as possible. They used very specific language in their writings and in their documentation about this. They would not call it a genocide. They would not refer to blood, killing, murder, etc. Hitler would even go to the great lengths of ensuring that his signature would not be tied to any documents concerning the genocide of the Jewish people. However, after this meeting in 1942, it was clear. Extermination. The Waffen-SS, under the direction of Heinrich Himmler, would form death squads known as Einsatzgruppen. They would round up and kill thousands upon thousands of undesirables, or Untermesh, under, under humans, in the newly conquered territories for the ideas of living space, or Lebensraum. This genocide would have a massive impact on soldiers of the Waffen SS because this is how it started. They would line up the Jews and the other Untermesh in these ditches and they would shoot them. And this would occur every 10 minutes, generally speaking. It got to a point where the Germans were using so much ammunition to do this that instead of shooting one person at a time in this massive long line, they would bunch people up so that a number of people could be, sh could be killed with one bullet. For example, a mother holding her child in a specific way so that when the bullet went through the mother, it would also go through the child. As you can imagine, this had a psychological effect on the Nazi soldiers that were doing the shooting. And to combat this, the genocide and Nazi, and Nazi war machine ramped up its genocide by developing the gas Zyklon B, along with developing numerous death camps in which the the Jewish people would be rounded up and taken to where they would be gassed, burned, and cremated thereafter. 1942 is also considered to be the turning point of the war. First, in the Pacific, you have the Battle of Midway. Pursuing their, their ultimate strategy, the Japanese decided that Midway was going to be this decisive clash between the Japanese and the United States in which Japan would crush the Pacific Fleet, crush U.S. morale, and bring a quick end to the war in the Pacific. However, the United States had been working on breaking the Japanese codes to troop movements, naval movements, etc. They managed to crack these just prior to the Battle of Midway. So the United States knew that the Japanese were coming. After bombing Midway and preparing it for invasion, <clears throat> the Japanese commander, Admiral Nagumo, was told that the American carriers were not where they were supposed to be. That, that meaning they were supposed to be in Pearl Harbor, but no, they were here. He decided to switch the ordinance from land to anti-ship ordinance, which created a situation in the aircraft carriers because they didn't put the ammunition back, meaning that these carriers, these aircraft carriers, were floating kegs of ammunition waiting to explode. And about two to three minutes later, 
the United States air the United States bombers from the car from the aircraft carriers dropped and descended on them, completely destroying the Kido Butai. The Kido Butai, the entire first carrier fleet, lost all four of its carriers in a single day, compared to the United States only losing one, which would be the USS Yorktown. As I said, this is the turning point of the, of the war in the Pacific, which would lead to the Battle of Guadalcanal, which took place in the Solomon Islands. This was the first instance of an amphibious assault by the Allied powers <clears throat> in the Pacific theater. And it would go rather smoothly because the Japanese really didn't have the island that well defended. The Battle of Stalingrad is the turning point in the European theater. Beginning in the spring of 42, the Germans begin to start a new offensive to secure the Caucasus oil fields to secure oil for its army, navy, and air force. During this battle, Stalin issues Directive Order 227, which is the Not a Step Back order, in which <laughs> he gives the go-ahead to Soviet officers and members of the Commissariat to kill any Russian that dares to take one step back or retreat from the field of battle. Hitler also orders his commanders not to retreat making it a absolutely titanic clash, resulting in the death of some 2.5 million total casualties, civilian and military, making this battle not only the bloodiest battle of World War II, but the bloodiest battle in recorded history. Thanks to the production production and mobilization that the United States has gone through, they have been sending aid to the Soviets, making sure that the Soviet Red Army has enough tanks and equipment to make a push back off of the back of this victory at Stalingrad. The first time you have American troops in the European theater would be Operation Torch. Operation Torch was the invasion of North Africa. Erwin Rommel and his North Africa Corps would be defeated in Egypt after a loss at El Alamein and will, and will retreat to Tunisia. From there, they would be surrounded by American forces under the command of General Patton and British General Montgomery. Rommel would be recalled back to Germany by Hitler, who didn't want to lose his, most, his top commander, and the North Africa Corps would be defeated and fall allowing the French colonies in Africa to switch allegiance from the Axis to Free France. Okay, first big thing. Here we go. Casablanca Conference. This is the first time that FDR and Churchill meet face-to-face -face since the war has started. <clears throat> At this conference, FDR and Churchill discuss the war and their plans coming to the following conclusions. One second. <clears throat> First of all, the only way that the war is going to end is with the unconditional surrender of all the Axis forces. That includes the minor powers, such as Romania, Bulgaria, all the ones that I listed earlier, but also the big ones, Germany, uh, Italy, and Japan. And both of the both FDR and Churchill agreed that the, uh, the best way to go about completing this was their next war target, being the soft underbelly of Europe, Italy. Stalin, who was not present at the meeting, absolutely hated this plan because up to this point, the Soviets had done the majority of the dying and he wanted the Western allies to launch an invasion into France so that it could relieve the Soviets on the Eastern Front. <clears throat> Invasion of Sicily happens and the American troops are greeted in Sicily as family, not in a, oh my God, you liberated us type of way, but no, as legitimate family. Remember that the major where did the majority of immigrants come from? 
in the 1920s and prior. Yes. And so a lot of American troops had extended family, grandparents, aunts, and uncles that they managed to liberate by moving into and invading Sicily and Italy. The invasion of Italy mainland would continue. However, Mussolini would be kicked out of his spot as leader of the Italians, to which Hitler sent more troops to Italy to secure his southern flank, and they would stop us from going any further in the, in the southern mountains of Italy. <clears throat> On the eastern front, Operation Citadel, Hitler prepares for another offensive against the Soviets. However, it is delayed to allow the new Tiger II and Panther tanks to get to the front line. The plan was to encircle the Soviets at the city of Kursk. However, <clears throat> thanks to the British intelligence passing along the Enigma Code to the Russians, they knew that the Germans were going to attack. This battle is considered to be the largest tank battle in history. The Soviets had managed to produce more tanks and artillery than the Germans could keep up with, but the Ger because the Germans, remember, were going with a qualitative approach when it came to their equipment, while the Soviets, the United States, Great Britain were going with a quantitative approach. Quantitative approach. Operation Citadel would be the last major German offensive along the Eastern Front. There's the pocket that was created along with the Battle of Kursk. There's the Russian counter charge. <clears throat> or an artist's depiction of it. Following the victories of Midway and Guadalcanal, the United States adopts the island hopping strategy, which is the United States strategy to, to, ta to take tactical and strategic islands across the Pacific to prepare for a final invasion of the Japanese mainland. This campaign begins with the invasion of the island of Tarawa, T-A-R-A-W-A. -A at this invasion, at this battle, the United States learns several lessons. The most important being that unlike the waters of Europe, where you can drive a Higgins boat all the way to the shore, there are a substantial amount of shallow areas and or coral reefs that surround the atolls and the islands of the Pacific, to which the United States creates and develops that thing up there, which is the LVT alligator, with tracks on it so that it can drive over shallow areas or so that it can drive over coral reefs and not get stuck. <clears throat> that way, soldiers can be delivered straight to the beach rather than being easy prey to enemy machine gun fire as you can see, is the result of the first day of combat of Tarawa there on the screen. There would be other lessons that they would learn too, but I, I don't have time to talk about it right now. This is a map of the central idea of the island hopping campaign. And you have Tarawa, the Gilbert Islands, the Marshall Islands, they skip Wake Island, they go to Guam, they go to Saipan, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa, and liberate the Philippines. All of these other smaller islands that you see were deemed non-strategic or were too heavily fortified by the Imperial Japanese forces for the United States to care about. <clears throat> yeah, which, going to get to that in a second. The Tehran Conference held in Iran. This is where the big three meet for the first time. They come to the conclusion that because of the stalemate in Italy, a second front needs to be opened in France. And they also discuss what to do and what the fate will be of Eastern Europe. Stalin wants complete authoritarian control over Eastern Europe, while FDR and Churchill want these nations to have self-determination. As you can see, we are already beginning to see a little bit of tension between the Soviets and the other Western allies but surely won't play any role anywhere in the future. Rome is liberated after we managed to push through at Monte Cassino. <clears throat> and then in 1943 to 1944, you have a misinformation campaign led by British intelligence. The Nazis knew that we were going to land somewhere along the coast of France. 
Most believed that we were going to land at the Point du Calais, which is the shortest amount of area between France and Great Britain. However, after placing Rommel in charge of the defense of the Atlantic Wall, he would conclude that the, that the Allies would invade at Normandy, but nobody listened to Rommel. Instead, they listened to Hitler. Which brings us to D-Day. On June 6, 1944, U.S. troops would land on Omaha and Utah beaches in the largest amphibious assault in recorded history. For those of you who have not seen Saving Private Ryan, <clears throat> first of all, it's a really good movie. Second of all, the first few minutes depict the landings on D-Day. They are the most accurate depiction of the landings of D-Day that has ever been recreated in film. They were so realistic that the United States the United States Army set up a suicide hotline for World War II veterans who were going to see the movie because it could potentially trigger bouts of PTSD. That's how realistic it is. So if you want an idea of what it looked like, go watch Saving Private Ryan, at least like I think it's the first 15 minutes or something like that. Also, Another thing to point out with D-Day especially, look back there on the board. Back there on the board, you have the different styles of command structure between the Allied powers that are the rectangles, the Nazis, which are the circles, and the Japanese Empire, which are the triangles. As you can see, within the Allied chain of command, anybody can talk to anybody else for aid. The British Navy can talk to the U.S. Army. The French Resistance can talk to the, the U.S. Army. The U.S. Army can talk to the, the British Army, and all of them can talk to Eisenhower. It is not that way in the Nazi High Command. Instead, if you are a part of the Wehrmacht, the German Army, you have to go talk to Hitler to potentially receive support from the Luftwaffe or the Air Force. All of that has to be dictated all the way to Berlin and then all the way to the high command of the Luftwaffe and then back, making the chain of command incredibly complex and complicated. Not only that, but the same situation is happening, happening with the Japanese. All of the information from the Imperial Japanese Navy is going to Admiral Yamamoto, who takes it to the Emperor. All of the information from the Imperial Japanese Army is going to Tojo, who takes it to the Emperor. But because the Emperor is a divine and supreme being, he should not be worried about the mortal matters of men. Therefore, Tojo and Yamamoto sometimes talk to one another, but not always. <clears throat> Just to give you an idea of how divisive it was in the Imperial, in the Imperial Japanese um, camp between the Army and the Navy, <laughs> the Army one time asked the Navy to help them transport troops off of an island, at which point, the Navy replied with, it is not the Navy's job to take the Army where it wants to go. All right, back to the actual timeline here. A bit of information that you probably don't need to know for the test, but I think is really important for you to know. Hitler did have political, in, political enemies within his high command it's still in 1944, and they tried to overthrow him in a coup d'etat. While visiting the Wolf's Lair, Hitler's headquarters for the, for the Eastern Front, a bomb went off in the room, killing several of the officers inside. But because Hitler was leaning over the table, the explosive blast went this way rather than up. And so it saved Hitler's life, prolonging the war by another year. Rommel would be blamed for the coup had no affiliation with the coup and didn't even knew, knew it existed, and he would have to commit suicide by cyanide. <clears throat> Paris would be liberated because of the events of D-Day, um, allowing France to rebuild itself and French General Charles de Gaulle to become the new leader of the French government. Operation Market Garden would happen, which was the Allied attempt to retake the Netherlands and end the war by Christmas of 44. This failed uh, because British forces, did, British high command that had prepared the invasion went one bridge too far. 
and they could not take the bridges over the Rhine, which is the river that separates France, the Netherlands, from Germany. The Battle of Leyte Gulf happens in the in late of late October of 44. It will be the largest naval battle of World War II with over 200,000 personnel. Fought near the waters of the Philippines and would be the last battle between battleships in history. The Japanese would lose the majority of the remainder of its fleet. And this would be the first instance of the use of kamikaze attacks. Kamikaze translated from Japanese to English roughly means divine wind. <clears throat> These kinds of attacks would continue until the end of the war. Much like the samurai in the Bushido Code, they did many Japanese pilots did not want to die, did not want to surrender or turn themselves over to the Allied forces. And so what they would end up doing is committing suicide by driving their planes into American ships, positions, artillery, etc. Due, due to the result of the Battle of Leyte Gulf, the, the U.S. forces would be able to retake the Philippines, in which MacArthur, Supreme Commander of the Pacific Forces, would be able to keep his promise, that saying, I have returned. He was a very, very theatrical man. For those of you who can see, this right here is the result of a kamikaze attack on a U.S. destroyer. And if the GIF was actually working, GIF, GIF, whatever it's called, was working, you would see that this is an actual kamikaze attack. He actually comes in and smashes into an aircraft carrier. Battle of the Bulge. <clears throat> in December of 44, Hitler tries to recreate the success of 1940 by diverting forces from the Eastern Front to face the Western Allies. What he does is he packs all of his panzer divisions back in the Ardennes Forest and tries to smash through the Allied forces. However, we were a little more prepared for it than we were in 1940. There is a massive bulge that is created on the line, which gives the Battle of the Bulge its name in which the 101st Airborne would be trapped inside the city of Bastogne. General Patton would lead the countercharge against the, against the Nazi attempt to take Antwerp and push them back over the Rhine. This would be, key point, this would be the last major German offensive along the Western Front. And here is a map of the Battle of the Bulge. All right. In January of 1944, as the Soviets are rolling across Eastern Europe, they come upon what they believe is an abandoned facility. At this facility, they begin to discover and find wedding bands, shoes, eyeglasses, and prosthetic limbs by the thousands. And then they discover that they're not alone in this facility. They begin to find people that are dying from starvation and disease. They have been left to die by the Waffen SS. The Soviets weren't even meant to take back Auschwitz or liberate it. They just so happened to stumble upon it. And upon stumbling upon it, learn the harsh reality of the death camps that were spread across Eastern Europe. And it quickly became a war objective to liberate these camps. One Soviet soldier said, looking back, we knew nothing. I remember their faces, though, especially their eyes, which betrayed their whole ordeal. And here you can see pictures of the Nazis loading up the Jewish people onto the trains the infamous train depot of Auschwitz itself. Behind the barbed wire, several different Jew, Jewish people. And then, if you look very closely into those cremation ovens, you can see 
human remains. The Yalta conference happens in February of 45 in Ukraine. The big three meet again to discuss the final stages of the war. And within this discussion, they come to the following conclusions. This is big stuff. You need to know this. One, Germany would be divided into four zones, controlled by the United States, Britain, France, and the USSR. Two, there would be, watch my hands, free elections within Eastern Europe. Three, the Soviets would help in the Pacific after the fall of Germany, and four, the major powers of the world would need to form a new peacekeeping coalition, which would end up becoming the United Nations. <clears throat> Iwo Jima. The United States would continue its island hopping strategy and invade the islands to secure airfields in order to increase the firebombing campaign against mainland Japan. Japanese forces were heavily fortified in this on this island through a series of network networks and tunnels. The Japanese forces would conduct bonsai charges, preferring death in service to the emperor and honoring the Bushido code rather than surrender. Surrender Low on ammunition and supplies, they would charge out and try to take as many Americans as they could with them. At this point during the war, you also begin to see a transition in the Japanese army towards violating specific points of the Geneva Convention, such as specifically targeting American medics. For those of you who have not seen Hacksaw Ridge, it covers some of Iwo Jima, which is, really good, is another really good World War II movie. The most iconic picture of the war would be taken at the Battle of Iwo Jima, which is the raising of the U.S. flag on Mount Sarabachi. This would not be the end of the battle. The battle would continue for several more days. But, to give you an idea of how bad the casualties were, out of the five men standing there that are raising that flag, there's one on the backside that you can't really see, only two of them would be alive at the end of the battle. The other three would die. The statues yes, there are statues of that all over the United States. So as the Allied power, as the Western Allies roll through Germany over the Rhine, they come face to face with the concentration camps of Germany. Do not be confused. There is a distinct difference between a concentration camp and a death camp. We'll go over that here in a little while if, if you guys remind me. Eisenhower, upon seeing all of what he has seen throughout this war, demands that the press come and document what they've got going on. He also invites the German citizens in the towns nearby to come and see what has actually been going on in these concentration camps saying, and I quote, get it all on record now. Get the films, get the witnesses, because somewhere down the road of history, someone will get up and say that this never happened. To this day, there are still people that deny that the Holocaust ever happened. It did. Do not get that twisted. Even some of the most battle-hardened commanders and soldiers within, within the liberation force of these camps became physically sick, General Patton being one of them. Old blood and guts himself would physically get sick and throw up because of the vile, terrible things that he saw at these camps. <clears throat> At Okinawa, you have the largest amphibious assault in the Pacific Theater, referred to as the Reign of Steel because of the ferocious fighting and intense kamikaze attacks. The Japanese would amplify their war crimes by using the majority of the civilian population as human shields, human sacrifices, human suicide bombers, however they could to potentially stop the American forces. 
They would even attempt to try to ram the last super battleship Yamato into the island to make it a formidable fortress. However, after six hours of constant aerial bombardment, the ship would be sunk just off the coast. It took 82 days for the U.S. forces to secure this island from Japan. 82 days just to secure an island, which resulted in the arguably the bloodiest battle of the Pacific. 160,000 military casualties and 150,000 Okinawan civilian casualties or, and deaths. Here's the catch, though. The population of the Okinawan people prior to the beginning of the war was only 300,000. Yeah, for those of you who can do math, you know. And here are some pictures of that. On April 12th, 1945, while, while at his home away from home in the Little White House in Warm Springs, Georgia, FDR starts to complain of suffering a terrible headache and suddenly drops to the floor. Doctors try to figure out what's going on and pronounce him dead. Vice President Harry S. Truman, who had only served as vice president for 82 days, is sworn in as the 33rd president on the same day at 7.09 p.m. Berlin ends up falling to the Soviets first. At this point in time, the majority of the German forces surrounding Berlin compromised the Volkstrom and what remains of the Waffen SS. The Volkstrom being old men and children, primarily. Stalin orders his generals to give no quarter against the Germans, which means no mercy, and, compare, and, com and he does not give the full direct order for any of his generals to do whatever, so they just do it. And what ends up happening is a bunch of rape, a bunch of pillaging, and a lot of murder. After the failure of his subordinate commanders to push back the Soviets, Hitler would commit suicide with his wife, Ava Braun, on April 30th. The following day, Joseph Goebbels takes over as the head of Germany, reads Hitler's last will and testament, and then also commits suicide along with his entire family. Here are some pictures. The, Russian try, the Russians tried to recreate a similar picture of the raising of the flag on Mount Sarabachi. That is the Soviet Union flag going up above the Reichstag, the German Congress. Over there you can see Hitler congratulating a little boy for deciding to fight for the glory of Nazism in its, dire, in its most dire moment. Sickening. Germany would finally surrender on May 7th, 1945, in what would become known as VE Day, Victory in Europe. Across the, across the Allied nations, you had mass celebration. The event would coincide with Harry Truman's birthday, who dedicated the victory to the recently deceased FDR. Since 1942, the Manhattan, Manhattan Project had been steadily at work developing the use of atomic weaponry because they feared that the Germans were working on it and that they would potentially beat them. The first successful test of these new weapons occurred on July 16, 1945 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, in which the leader of the project, J. Robert, Robert Oppenheimer, would say, and I quote, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. While still alive, FDR had managed to keep the Manhattan Project a strict secret, not even letting Harry Truman know what it knew of, ex of its existence. After Truman was sworn in as president, he was told of the project's potential power, and now he was faced with a decision on whether or not to use it. The Potsdam Conference in Germany would be the last major conference between the big three in which that they would discuss the war in the Pacific. 
Truman warned Japan that if they did not surrender unconditionally, they would suffer annihilation. Now, while the Manhattan Project was top secret, because of the tensions between the Western Allies and the Soviets, the Soviets had already begun sending spies throughout the world. Stalin knew that the Manhattan Project existed. He didn't necessarily know its specifics, but he knew that it was a superweapon of some kind. Foreshadowing tensions here. On August 6th and 9th, you have the dropping of the atomic... Okay, as you can see, uh, <laughs> the scenery has changed. The reason for that is because when I got to the conclusion of the lecture for uh, today, April the 11th, I realized that I did not have enough space to get the last little bit of the lecture on uh, World War II military and post-war diplomacy. So um, we're now going to cover the last little section of that, um, of that lecture. So if you would, uh, the title of the slide is The Dropping of the Atomic Bombs, August 1945. On August 6th and August 7th, the atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, the decision had been made by Harry Truman to use the bombs after talking with his uh, with the US High Command and after many days of thought and reflection on whether or not this would be a better outcome. And what I mean by that is, is that the United States had been, since the beginning of the war, had been preparing to do an invasion of mainland Japan. Uh, the numbers and the estimates as to how many lives would be lost as a result of this invasion, which would be known as Operation Downfall, would, at a loose estimate by the U.S. High Command, would result in the death of some three million American soldiers. In addition to that, it would also be the, you would have a same number of casualties and deaths for the Japanese people. But even more so, you would have to end the Japanese cultural way of life because of their strict devotion to the emperor and the ideas surrounding him being a divine ruler, a divine godlike figure within their society. And so this, among many other reasons, is why uh, Harry Truman made the decision to go ahead and use atomic weapons, which is the first, <laughs> and up to this point, the only time in which atomic weapons have ever, atomic or nuclear weapons, have ever been used in war, period. Um, another key point is in between the dropping of the bombs on August the 8th, Stalin had managed to redirect his forces from the east over to the west to help out with the war in the Pacific. And the Soviet Union declared war on Japan and invaded Japanese-held Manchuria in order to gain something out of the uh, Pacific theater for the Soviet Union. So, on the next slide. These are four different pictures uh, going from left to right. Pictures one, two, three, and four. Pictures one and three are pictures of before the bombs were dropped, and pictures two and four are pictures after the bombs were dropped. The pi pictures one and two are pictures of Hiroshima, and pictures three and four are pictures of Nagasaki. As you can clearly see by the pictures, there was nothing left standing 
in these cities. The cities had been completely reduced to rubble and waste. Along with that, if you go to the next slide, which is entitled Morality and the Decision to Drop the Atomic Bombs, the dropping of the bombs resulted in massive amounts of casualties, not just military, but civilian casualties as well. Um, it would be a total estimate of somewhere between 90,000 and 146,000 casualties at Hiroshima. At Nagasaki, it would be somewhere between 39,000 and 80,000. Um, however, there, were, there would be survivors of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Roughly, as of March of 2021, the Japanese government has on file the names of about 128,000 individuals that are still alive that uh, survived the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. One interesting story about, about the individuals that survived these bombings, one man he, uh, who lived in Hiroshima and survived the bombing of Hiroshima was like, all right, I need to go to work now. I need to go help with the Japanese war effort. Jumped on a train and went to Nagasaki and survived the Nagasaki bombing as well. A lot of these individuals that lived in these cities that managed to survive um, ended up dying as well because of radiation poisoning and the nuclear fallout the atomic and nuclear fallout that occurred after the bombs had been dropped. Uh, historians, political analysts, military strategists all agree that there were other ulterior motives to Truman's decision to drop the A-bombs on Japan. Um, the most pivotal of these being the fact that there had been consistently throughout the war rising tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, we can see that in every single conference that had been held throughout the war, all the way from the Tehran Conference all the way to the Potsdam Conference. Um, Stalin was continuously trying to become, or trying to be more authoritarian while FDR and then Truman and then Churchill and his replacement were trying to advocate for more free elections, more, you know, self-determination within the territories of Eastern Europe and the world at large. Um, Truman's decision to drop the bomb was everything that we talked about in terms of preserving American lives, preserving the Japanese way of culture, uh, from dying out, but it also served as a warning to the Soviet Union in that, look at what we have. We have these weapons of mass destruction that in the blink of an eye can kill and destroy this amount of people, resources, etc. This was the first time, only time so far, in history in which these weapons were deployed in warfare and to a, to a great degree it helped to can increase the, the tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union which would lead to a nuclear arms race between the two countries during the Cold War which Mr. Reese will talk about in the coming days and weeks as he goes through the Cold War. So, on the next slide, VJ Day. The Japanese High Command and War Council to the Emperor debated heavily on whether or not they even should surrender uh, following the first atomic bomb at Hiroshima. Historians argue and debate over whether or not the bombing of Nagasaki was necessary. And a lot of historians, political analysts, etc., loosely agree that the second bombing was a message to the Soviet Union. Um, 
the War Council to the Emperor reached no conclusion on whether or not they should or should not surrender. And so, with them having no decision, they went before the Emperor, Emperor Hirohito. And they laid out all of the possibilities, they laid out everything to him, and he came to the conclusion that the Japanese people need to endure the unendurable and suffer what is unsufferable, and that meaning surrender. Um, Emperor Hirohito spoke a different dialect of Japanese. It was a more ancient dialect of, of Japanese, and so when he talked, it was a little more regal, high type thing, um, in which a lot of people really didn't necessarily understand what he was saying, but this is what he was saying. He said that we need to surrender to preserve Japan and end the suffering and, end, and cease any potential greater destruction that the United States could potentially impose upon us. Uh, and he, as emperor, on the 15th of August, would go to the radio waves of Japan, which would be the first time he ever did, did so. He had never spoken to the people directly before this. And he announced uh, that, quote, the war situation has not necessarily developed to Japan's advantage, which was his own way of saying to the Japanese people, that it's over. We have lost and we are going to surrender. Um, despite this, you did have a small faction within the Japanese military that tried to overthrow the government in a coup d'etat uh, actually on the day of, of, his of the Emperor's announcement to the people. The coup would fail and the coup would fail, and uh, it would allow for the delegates of the emperor to go aboard uh, the U.S. battleship Missouri, and they, in, when it reached Tokyo Bay on, December, on September 2nd, and they, along with the Supreme Commander of the Allies in the Pacific, Douglas MacArthur, would sign the unconditional surrender of Japan, which ended World War II. Um, and with that, I believe we're done. If you want to look at the next slide, the next slide has um, some of the pictures from VJ Day, which VJ Day stands for Victory in Japan Day. And this was celebrated not on the day of the signing, but on August the 15th. Uh, with that, make sure to study for your test and um, do the pair deck. And uh, with that, I look forward to seeing you in class tomorrow for the test on World War II.